Well, good evening, friends, fans, and followers. Sorry about that little glitch there at the beginning. My computer's running a little bit slow, and all of a sudden I'm getting pop-ups saying my connection is slow. So uh, I apologize for that. Bear with me, guys. Um, hey, thanks for joining the inaugural stream. Um, we'll see how it goes. I do appreciate you being here. I am Matt with Tales on Trails Deer Tracking. What I want to do tonight is just part one of a two-part series talking about uh, the some fundamental things about deer tracking. I excuse me. I wrapped up my first year deer tracking as part of the Michigan Deer Tracking Network this year, and I learned a whole bunch of things. And what I want to talk about today is largely foundational stuff. It's uh, stuff that I learned firsthand. It's stuff that I've learned uh, from personal mentors. It is stuff that I've learned from other experienced and accomplished incredible trackers on podcasts and YouTube videos and things like that. Um, I'm also going to push this to a, the audio uh, of this recording to a podcast. So if you're a podcast listener, you are probably going to, you, you'll miss out a little bit on um you miss out a little bit on some of the visual because I'm going to go through a PowerPoint on some of this stuff. But uh, you can always go over to Tales on Trails Deer Tracking on Facebook and YouTube and watch it back later. Uh, we're live streaming to both of those platforms right now, and and they'll live there, so you can go look them up. Um, you know, I want to encourage engagement. Hi, Ron. Thanks, thanks for the shout out there, buddy. Um, uh, I want to encourage engagement. You know, if you have questions, ask. Uh, but type them into the comments. Um, they'll pop up. I'll see them. Uh, if you're trying to add something to the subject we're talking about, man, please comment because, you know, I, I'm doing this largely, um, well, for lots of reasons because I want it, to, it, it's fun for me, you know, and I'm hoping to learn. So what I want to do is we're going to, we're going to do, um, Tonight, we're going to do part one of deer tracking with dogs and what the hunter should know. And then probably next week, we'll do part two. But it's the fundamental two reasonably academic, I guess, um, streams. What I want to do is then start um, doing smaller, short segments the, the segments would be about 45 minutes depending on how long i uh or how off the rails i get but i want to um start shorter segments of specific topics and then i want to have trackers to come on it, more experienced people to talk about those topics um i'm not an expert in anything uh, that's why what I'm going to present today is pretty topical. If you are a tracker, I could give you this PowerPoint and you wouldn't have to look at it and you could you could do this presentation. That's how foundational it is. So trackers, you probably won't get much. That's not my intent, but I want to share it with hunters because I learned a lot. There's a lot of stuff on here that I didn't know before I started tracking, and I think it will be helpful. I know there's some things that would have been helpful for me when I was a hunter because I would not have lost some deer. Caused my buddy to lose deer. Um, we'll talk, I think, in part two. But, um, you know, so so that's my intent. And then what I want to do, too, is in, in addition to the, the uh, smaller segments of experienced people providing the expertise on, on those topics, I want to start a series, uh, Tales on Trails presents Tales from the Trail, I think I'm going to call it, where I want to have other trackers come on, on experience level, doesn't matter. I want other trackers to come on and uh, talk about a memorable track that, that you had um, for whatever reason it is, unusual, fun, uh, something that you learned on that track. Um, it, something entertaining, but something memorable, memorable to you. And then what I want to do is, is hopefully there's a morsel or two of learnings that we can get out of that. Um, you know, something that the hunter can learn, something that you learned on that track that you think is 
we're sharing some other community. and like I'm a little self serving here. Bear with me, my my connection just glitched. Right. But um, I'm a little bit self serving here because I really want to learn myself, um, and that's where the experts come in. I've already reached out to a couple of guys. Um, they said they'd be willing to contribute. So we'll slow build this thing. I'll bring people on. If you, if you're a tracker and want to come on, um, man, give me, please, please give me a shout. If you, if you have a, a topic that you are, you, you, you feel something in, let's, let's put it out there. And what we'll do is we'll tag all of your, your, um, you, you know, your tracking page in there. So all of your followers can, can uh, view it as well. So, now that's kind of my long-term vision. So this is my inaugural stream. See how it goes. I welcome all feedback because I, I, I want to be better. Uh, I want to get better. So, you know, I'm, I'm just a guy in my basement, as you can see, that doesn't know much about technical stuff, trying to um, trying to have some fun. And it kind of extends the tracking. I love I love the tracking. And here's just another element to it when it's too cold and too deep of snow to to lay practice track. So, so that's my vision, you know, uh, don't be afraid to engage here, send comments, questions. I do maximize my screen so I can see it better. I'll have to see comments pop up with me as I go back and forth. Um, but, uh, let's just, um, let's just kick into this, right? Okay. We're all through. Actually, if you have questions, if you have questions, uh, chime in. Now, the good thing is I get smaller, so you don't have to have me as prominent here. And I'll um, maximize. Go over here. Well, you know, there are some things that we're going to talk about. We'll, we'll list them here. Right here. The, here. Here are the topics for tonight. Like I said, this will take about 45 minutes. I don't know, somewhere around there. But, uh, you know, if you hang with me, great. If not, you can watch it on a playback. If, if, if it's just you can't stomach it anymore, I apologize. Um, but uh, we're going to talk about rules of tracking. These are my rules of tracking that I stole from others, most of the which, you know, there's nothing original here for me. I didn't create any of this except for maybe one small thing that uh, in, in reference to blood, but everything else is, is completely and absolutely plagiarized from, from other people. So, uh, and I, and uh, you know, I have no shame in that and I, and I will credit them a, as appropriate here. So we're going to talk about the rules of tracking. We're going to talk about the misconception, fun facts about the dog's nose, what the dog is smelling on the track. Uh, we're going to talk about the inner digital gland in a little more detail. Um, about scenting conditions. Uh, we'll have an overview of the three most common blood types, and then we'll talk about good and blood or, or uh, good blood versus trackable blood. There is a difference. This is this, that's a fun one too. So, so th that's uh, that's the agenda, so to speak, or the topics of discussion. So, number one rule in tracking. Rule number one of tracking: be honest with your tracker. Any podcast, any experience tracker, anybody you talk to that. Um, uh, you know, they're going to tell you, be honest. That's the first thing, be honest. The truth is bad because generally speaking, we're if you're not, it's going to come out. And so what do we mean by be honest with your tracker? If you grid search an area, first of all, grid search kind of makes trackers break out in a rash. But we understand that that is a normal part of, of it. You don't know you need help until you can't find your deer and you, you made an attempt to find it. So we understand that grid searching is part of tracking. It's just the world we live in. But if we can avoid doing that, we'll talk about that more. If we can avoid doing that, it just makes things better. If you grid search, tell your tracker that you grid searched. If uh, you didn't, uh, you know, because we're going to find out when the dog, by the dog's body language, we'll know whether your grid search is based on the dog is behaving. Um, some, some hunters can, um, are starting to learn um, but they should say to get a tracker out there. So if you really hit them in a high shoulder and you want the tracker to come out, but, uh, you, so you tell him you hit him, you know, in the guts, that truth is going to come out. Um, because we're probably not going to recover you during that scenario. You know, if you shot him at, uh, eight in the morning or, 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 you know, four in the afternoon and you call the tracker at six, and told him you shot him at eight in the morning, you know, because you want to get out there sooner. You know, those things are going to come out. So just be honest. It's going to pro honesty is going to 
uh, can approach that track. So, so honesty is, is really everything. It's the efficient path to a recovery. So honesty is cool, man. Just please do. Rule number one A. I totally stole this from Brian Albert. Brian, if you're watching, shout out, brother. Thank you. But never say never, never say always. There are no absolutes. Yeah, I'd never, never say never, never stop, but that's the part that's Brian. He um, uses that all the time, and I totally stole that and found in my 42 tracks this season that, yep, yeah, that applies just about everywhere. Never say never, never say always. If you think, you know, my deer would never go over there, guess where your deer probably went? Uh, um, wounded deer won't run up here, won't ever run uphill. What, what do you suppose wounded deer do? They'll run uphill, you know, those kinds of things. So, so all of those hunters truths that we grew up believing, throw them out the window, you know, never say never, never say always. There are no absolutes rule number one, a, um, so the misconception about tracking blood tracking, it's commonly referred to as blood tracking. All of the, you know, the, the national network, uh, is called United blood track, uh, United blood trackers.org. Check them out. Uh, but that's that's the national um, organization. All of the books and podcasts and YouTube videos and all of that are titled um, uh, "Blood Tracking." So um, it's a misconception misconception because dogs do not need blood to track. They absolutely do not need blood. But nice. You and I like blood. You and I like blood because it's a visual confirmation. Dogs don't care. They don't track with their eyes. They don't need blood. And we'll talk about that in a little bit more here. But, um, you know, blood tracking is a misconception. We do not need blood. Little fun facts. About I, I reference bloodhounds here because that's what I track with. That's my tracking partner is a bloodhound. I love bloodhounds as much of a pain in the butt as they can be. I love them to death. They're great dogs. Uh, so I reference bloodhounds here a lot on this slide, but that does not, suggest that a bloodhound is any more capable of finding deer than say a Bavarian mountain hound or a, coon hound, a blue tick coon hound, a German shepherd, a Malinois, uh, a Tekel, um, a Catahoula, you know, all, all of those um, other dogs that have the drive to do it. And that's really the key. You know, uh, the, the best tracking dog is a dog that has the drive to do it. It doesn't matter the breed. But I have bloodhounds, so I reference some bloodhounds here. Just uh, some, just some fun facts. You know, a dog sees with its nose. We kind of, I kind of alluded to that on the the misconception. Sees with its nose. It does not track with its eyes, so it doesn't care what it looks like. It paints the picture. It sees with its nose, and it sees more vividly when it's. It sees as vividly with its nose, just as pretty as you're looking at this this PowerPoint presentation right here. That's how clearly uh, a bloodhound image is. So humans have about four to six million set receptors in their nose. Uh, so to kind of tell you how good a dog's nose is, is a bloodhound has 300 million, approximately 300 million. That's a lot of millions. Uh, bloodhound is the animal whose findings are admissible in court. I, I come across that when I was researching what type of breed to get. Uh, for tracking, and I thought that was pretty cool. So, you know, we all know the stories and legends of bloodhounds tracking down criminals. Blake Shelton's got a song about it, Old Red, I think. Um, so I thought that was a neat fact. Um, so we, we, we talk about, no, so if a bloodhound has 300 million scent receptors and is, is supposedly the best nose of the, uh, of the dogs, of all the dog breeds, it is believed that a deer is 30% stronger than that yet. I got that from another podcast. I wish I could remember which podcast it was and who said it so I could credit it appropriately. But, um, you know, you know, so it says it's 30% uh, better than a canine. Canine includes a coyote, and a coyote's better than, than, um, than a bloodhound. You know, so coyotes have incredible uh, sense of smell because it's how they survive. You know, so they have to, and we could we could do a whole segment on that. In fact, most of these slides could probably have their own hour long presentation. Uh, I'm not going to. We'll, we'll, we'll do breakouts on some of them, maybe. But but um, so a deer's nose is 30 percent stronger. So when you're putting that shit spray on and you're putting turning on your ozonics, I do both of those things. Um, you're probably not fooling that deer. I do believe in ozonics. I believe it works. But um, 
you know, I think it's just diluting your scent enough to for the deer to believe the threat is either farther away than than it than you are, or or just causes them to pause long enough to get off the shot. But I believe the only way to truly fool a deer's nose is uh, is play the wind. So deer is thirty percent better. But that's some fun facts about the dog's nose. So how does the dog that knows? What is the dog tracking? In the tracking world, we refer to it as the scent cocktail. And it, it, it's all kinds of different things. It's the interdigital gland. We're going to talk more about the interdigital gland on the next slide. But it's the interdigital gland, the gland between the deer's um, toes, the hooves. You'll see it in a minute. Uh, the dander off deer hair. If there is blood as part of the scent cocktail, the dogs don't need it. But if it's there, it... Um, it, it, it's part of it. Uh, you know, wound gases, anytime you shoot a deer, particularly in the body cavity, you know, it is releasing gases all, all the while, particularly at the shot site. So you get that at the shot site, there's a huge setting up that arrow smacks the deer and the deer is shocked and all of the, the, the hair and deer is kind of shocked off it. The, the deer typically drops, scurries, hustles. So all that activity uh, at the shot site dumps a bunch of scent. And all those microscopic particles of whatever's coming out of the deer, you know, if you got a pass through, there's more. But it's even going to come out if you don't get a pass through. Um, you know, there's a whole lot of stuff you're not seeing uh, that the dog sees with their nose. We'll get done an interesting one breath listen to another podcast. I was listening to another podcast, and again, I wish I could remember it. They were talking about mantering dogs. Um, and there was a test or a trial or something they did where they had somebody get dressed up in a hazmat suit, all dressed up in a hazmat suit. So all of the dander, hair, blood, sweat, stink, you know, the, the, Charlie Brown character pig pen has that dust cloud. We all have a dust cloud, a uh, stink cloud around us too. It's all contained within that hazmat suit. The subject runs across the field or out in the woods or wherever it goes, and they release the dog. I don't know what breed of dog it was. And the dog was able to track that suspect, even though all of the body odors and things were being contained within that hazmat suit. And they say it was the breath. It was the breath of the the of that subject apparently he wasn't wearing a shield so so um you know it's believed that even the breath of a deer makes up the scent cocktail um you know think about it a deer's running it's huffing a lot especially if it's breathing hard if it's you know if it's wounded so that makes some sense so guess what if they can deer if ducks can smell a deer breath then the deer can smell your breath too so i suppose if you have stinky breath you're easy to track i don't know so that's the scent cocktail. A lot of things there. We hope there's blood, but if there's no visible blood, it, do, it doesn't matter. There's microscopic particles of blood, maybe, or or maybe not. Our second recovery, our third recovery, I don't know. We could recover the deer this year, not one stitch of blood. The only evidence we had was, um, was some hair about 10 yards from the shot site. That was it. I saw absolutely nothing else. We recovered that deer, got shot. So yeah, I told you we'd talk more about the inner digital gland. The inner digital gland is is the primary uh, ingredient in that scent cocktail. I'll call it. You see it right there in the picture here. It's the, it's the area between the deer do the, the the deer's hooves, toe, whatever, and it emits a waxy type substance that you know create that that has a scent specific to that deer, and it's uh, the the deer use it is a way to communicate you know if you think about that old buck when he's scraping the ground you know making a scrape you know that inner digital sense being left there when that old donkey doe that bust you every other night in your tree stand and she stomps the ground i used to think she was trying to get you to move how silly she's not trying to get you to move what she's doing is putting that inner digital gland in the ground uh, and it's creating an, uh, an alert scent and, and letting others know that she was alarmed in that area you know, that's how a buck will track a specific doe through the woods. It's how deer identify each other. Oh, there's Joe, there's Larry, there's Bill, there's Susie. You know, it's the inner digital gland. Uh, so it's a method of deer communi communication. Now, the biggest thing for track, when a deer is wounded or stressed, 
it starts to produce a stress pheromone. That stress pheromone emits through the individual line, as you see here, there. So when a deer is shot, becomes stressed. So there, as part of that whole scent dump is that stress uh, pheromone that starts to emit from the inner digital gland. As the deer runs off, it continues to be stressed and it continues to emit that stress pheromone. And, and it's emitted here. And as long as that deer is fatally wounded, it's gonna continue to um, produce that stress scent. If you get the classic high shoulder shot, for example, and your deer bolts off for 200 yards, and then, bed, you know, then starts walking and beds down in 300 yards. And it starts to realize that the, the threat is gone. It's out of danger. And it, and it realizes it's not going to die from whatever just happened to it. The deer doesn't know what happened to it. He just knows something happened to him he didn't like. But once a deer realizes it's not going to die and it no longer feels threatened, it stops producing that stress pheromone. And then the scent changes for that deer. And it starts to smell like any other deer in the woods. And that's when a dog can lose it. You, some of you may have seen, experienced trackers, I know have. But if you're a hunter, perhaps you've had to utilize a dog where the dog tracked like a machine uh, for the first two to 300 yards and, and got to that wound bed where you lost blood. And then all of a sudden the dog just loses interest. It's because the scent changed. It stopped producing that scent fair or that stress pheromone and it's having a hard time picking it up or experienced dogs simply, even if they can't identify the deer, they simply know the deer's not dead and it's not, and it has no interest in tracking it. Experienced dogs will do that. Friend, uh, friend of mine's dog uh, and mentor, when his dog reaches that point, they'll just sit down and refuse to track. So that's when it's time to start having conversations with the hunter. And, and trackers will kind of know that, um, that that might be coming just based on the sign and the evidence and, and all of the pieces of the puzzle that they've gathered throughout the track. So, um, you know, th that's what happens. That's why it's a primary ingredient. And most trackers, when they're training, this is what they're training on is this, is this inner digital gland right here. Um, you know, we're taking deer legs and we're putting them on the bottom of, our, uh, of deer that have run and been stressed. And we're putting them on the bottom of our tracking shoes and laying a, a false line. Most of us don't even use blood when we train or very little blood. I used, very, you know, a little bit of blood last year, maybe half an ounce or less on the trail. I, and I'm going to try even less than that this year just so the dog is, gets accustomed to tracking that blood. And she did pretty good on the 42 tracks we went on this year. So, uh, and, and like, I said before, it's the ingredient in the scent cocktail. Um, so that that's the uh, inner digital gland. It's a, it's a pretty critical piece to um, to the tracking world. So, um, what's next? Scenting conditions. So, scenting conditions, quite frankly, can make or break a recovery. Um, is one of the things that can make or break a recovery. There's um, there's a, a lot of things that can make or break a recovery recovery but scenting conditions are one of them and, and if you're watching this you know the, the 2022 season early season was terrible for for uh, scenting conditions so what are they hot dry and windy are poor scenting conditions and uh cool moisture and calm are good scenting conditions so why is hot dry and windy bad well hot if we think about um thermals as hunters we've talked about thermals forever and there's been lots of articles written about thermals, but that's in context of what our scent is doing. In the morning, it's rising, and in the in the uh, evening, it, it it's settling. You know that is um, th those are thermals. Well, the same thing applies to a to a track line. So when it's hot out, and you shot a deer in the morning, and you know it's early October, and it was you know 52 degrees. Now, all of a sudden, here we are, you know, by noon, it's warmed up to 75 degrees or something. And that sun is beating down on that track. As the sun beats down on that track, the thermals rise and it lifts that sun up. And as it's dry, there's nothing there to, 
to hold that scent. So, so hot, let's say, there's nothing for the test tune. And windy, windy uh, pushes that scent around. As it's hot, dry, and it lifts, it's just, you know, kind of evaporating that scent away. That, um, you know, then the wind comes in and it starts to push whatever scent there's left. It starts to push it around, you know, and now you're starting to get a bunch of scent drift. So, um, plus it, it slipped us in a little bit. So that's why hot, dry, and windy are bad conditions. And, and it, you know, it doesn't take all three of those to be bad. Hot can be bad. Drying itself can be bad. Windy in itself can be bad. All three together are the trifecta of bad. Um, conversely, cool, moisture, and calm are good conditions. Cool, obviously, because now the thermals, the sun isn't beating down as much and lifting those thermals, although there are still thermals, you know, even if it's, uh, you know, 40 at night and uh, the sun comes up in the morning, it's warming up that ground, the thermals are still lifting. But, um, you know, it, it's just not quite as prevalent. Plus, cool is easier on the dog. Tracking is hard work on a dog and, and old trackers like me, old men like me, it's it's nice when cooler. Uh, moisture, so it's huge, guys. Moisture is very important. What I will tell you is if you are a hunter and you shoot a deer, do not push the track too soon because it is raining or there is rain in the forecast. Uh, moisture is generally speaking a good thing. Um, it enhances scent. So what moisture does, I kind of spoke to it a little bit on the, on the bad scenting conditions about dry. What moisture does is the scent molecules now attach themselves to the moisture molecules and the scent can hold there. So if you think, if you think about your dog and what a dog smells like, um, I mean, if you have any kind of hound, you know they stink. God bless them. But, it, but if you think about a dog, which dog smells like dry, then get your dog wet and think about what a wet dog smells like. It stinks more. And that is an example of moisture enhancing scent. The same thing happens on the, on the scent trail. So, you know, a, a, a regular old fall drizzle, um, those, those are, th that's good. That's good. If we get a 24 hour, hour torrential downpour, that's different. That that could impede the dog's ability to track. But that that standard old fall drizzle, that's a good thing. Trackers like that. And I, I will tell you, I've seen my dog track very differently in dry conditions versus uh, wet conditions. Um, th there's a distinct difference. And then calm, obviously, because I kind of talked about it before. Um, you know, as long as your scent, the closer your scent stays to the source, the better it is. Calm, uh, uh, wind and breeze pushes your scent. Air is always moving. Air is always moving. So the scent is going to disagree, but, you know, if it's windy, it's going to push it harder, far and farther. Where if it's calm, it's just not, it's not going to move around as much. So that's good. So, so that's good and bad scenting conditions. So now let's talk about blood. I call blood the crimson seductress. It can seduce you into doing things you should not do. Do not take the bait. I will tell you before I start in tracking, I have been seduced by the crimson seductress. It just sits there and, and just goes like this and teases you to, to, to keep coming when you shouldn't. So blood can be very difficult, but it can seduce you. And you've got to be disciplined enough to not pursue or don't succumb to her advances when you know you shouldn't. And we'll talk more about that. So blood is the crimson seductress. And, you know, so we'll talk about some characteristics of blood. Like I said, I am no blood expert. I will tell you, if if you guys uh, know Mike Rippon from Michigan Deer Track and Hounds, 
or if if you don't look him up on Facebook, he's doing a really nice series on uh, some of the stuff. And and he posted one today about muscle blood, and that's one of the things we're going to talk about. It was really really good, um, and he had some good examples too. So uh, so check out Mike Ribbon Ripping on on Facebook. Uh, it, it, it's a Michigan Deer Track and Hound. Is his face is his tracking service, but anyway, you know, a lot of different characteristics depending on where it comes from, and and we're going to focus here on muscle blood, liver blood, and arterial blood. Kind, of, I think probably the most common bloods, but um, um, you know, again, I'm no blood expert. It's just, this is just what I've learned uh, firsthand, and what I've learned from from uh, people I trust. And, and other credible and accomplished. So let's talk about muscle blood. Where, you know, muscle blood is commonly, you know, stop sign red. This is uh, one I totally plagiarized. I, I got the never say never, never say always from friend and tracker Brian Alberta. I totally stole uh, all the stop sign red from Eric Peterson, another friend and mentor. Um, it is the color of a stop sign. So, um, you, you know how I'll use that when interviewing a hunter. I'll 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 ask them. I said, you know, I said, if you use the color of a stop sign, stop sign run as a baseline, would you consider the blood you're seeing to be darker than that, or more of a lighter or pinkish hue than that? And they'll tell me, nope, nope, it's a stop. It, it's the color of a stop sign. That's what it is. I'm like, okay, now uh, that tells me something. Muscle blood has a tendency to clot. Deer are built to survive. And they have very high concentrations of vitamin K1 and K2. That's the clotting agent. So when a deer is hit in a non-lethal space, like, uh, you know, a high shoulder or the classic back whack or something, it's going to bleed. And it can bleed quite profusely. And it can fool you. Um, but as soon as it's hit, that vitamin K starts to activate and work its way towards the wound and starts to clot. It starts to clot that so the deer can survive, of course, so it doesn't bleed out. And that happens very quickly. So typically the call will come in from the hunter. Hey, I, I, shot, the, I, I shot the deer. Uh, I think I hit him a little high. Um there was good blood. We'll talk about good blood in a minute. But he, you know that, that, that there there was good blood, and and I tracked him. And man, I saw these. Big, they think they have chunks of uh, lung or something. Um, and then uh, it went into the swamp, and it started to peter out. And then at about 200, 250 yards, I lost blood. Yep, that's because the blood clotted. Now, you may go a gap of, um, you know, 50, 60, 80, 100 yards, I don't know, and start picking up, up blood again. It could be that you blasted, as, as you're pursuing that deer, you bumped him, blasted him out of there, he blew out the clot, and it's going to clot again. So you kind of have that on and off. But, it, it, you know, that that's very commonly how that call will go. Um, you know, muscle blood has a tendency. So where, where does muscle blood come from anywhere meaty high back shoulder neck bucket leg hindquarters anywhere meaty really um and like i said before whoops it commonly stops uh bleeding in the uh approximately 200 yards maybe more but you know it generally stops bleeding so here's an example of what muscle blood looks like you know you see i kind of define it as um uh you know blood with no character um it's just there it's just blood it's just red um you know if you look at the edge of this um it looks like if you can see it it looks like maybe it is um maybe it is uh you know starting to thicken up or something um but it's just there it's just stop sign red it's blood with no character you know so that, that's an example of muscle blood one example and and like i said there, there are lots of examples um check out my uh, Michigan Deer Track and Hounds, he's got some really good pictures of, of really heavily coagulated blood that people mistake for um, for lung matter. You don't generally blow the lungs out of a deer with a gun or a, or a bow. So, so that's an example of muscle blood. Next is liver blood. Now, look, guys, 
muscle blood and liver blood can be really tough to tell the difference between. So you, you kind of got to, you know, look at those details and kind of know some of the distinctions between the two. But liver blood is commonly darker, um, darker red than muscle blood. It's going to be a little, you know, maybe a little more crimson, depending on what part of the liver the deer was hit. You know, the, the um, you know, blood comes into the top of the out and, you know, then goes through the liver and filters and, and disperses. But, um, you know, depending on what part of the liver uh, the deer was hit in as to how dark or not dark, you know, it might be. Um so liver blood also tends to be a thinner consistency. I remember um, when I was a young know-it-all hunter, I thought, I thought, um, I thought liver blood was thicker. It's not thicker. It's a little. It tends to be thinner, a thinner consistency. It commonly dries pink on an arrow. So, you know, if you you're looking at an arrow and it and it's a uh, uh, in blood and it's um, kind of dried as a dull pink uh, color. And when you scratch it, uh, you know, or, or, or tap it on something, it, um, it will kind of flake off sort of like fish food or maybe, maybe that old, old farmhouse that you have to, you know, you know scrape the paint off. It kind of looks like old, old, old paint or something uh, as it flakes. The, another indication of a liver deer is on arrows, the, there'll be kind of a specks or um, a, a you know, little tiny pieces of grit on the fletchings, um, you know, that, you know, sort of spread throughout the fletching. So that is, um, th those are a couple of indications of, of liver hit. And liver blood won't clot. Like I said, organ blood won't clot. Where muscle blood will, liver blood will not. Here's an example of what liver blood might look like. It just, I don't know how well this shows up. This isn't the greatest picture of liver blood, but this is a, this is a picture from the first deer that Baru and I ever recovered. Um, it was a plum square liver shot deer. And you can kind of see, and this was the wound bed from that, kind of, um, that it is thinner uh, and, and a little bit darker. I don't know what these chunks are here. I don't remember um but anyway if you look everywhere else you kind of see it's a lot thinner this dirt underneath the uh, leaves here was really saturated with blood very very saturated so a little bit darker a little bit thinner not the greatest picture but you kind of get a feel for the flavor of what it is you know arterial slash lung blood this is the blood that everybody wants and frankly kind of thinks they have quite often but uh our all lung blood is arterial blood but arterial blood isn't necessarily all lung blood um it's going to be a brighter pain that's highly oxygenated oxygen is what um oxygen levels what determines the the brightness of the blood you know arterial blood is what's carrying the oxygen to the rest of the deer and all the muscles and things so it's highly oxygenated um it's often frothy if you um you know, particularly if you hit it in the lungs, it's, it's probably you're aspirated, full of hundreds of bubbles, um, aspirated blood. It's thin, thin and watery. Uh, arterial blood tends to be thin and watery. And again, arterial blood will not clot. Uh, arterial blood, when it dries on an arrow, it, uh, it can dry kind of a, um, you know, sort of sticky or tacky, almost like... Um, almost like um, half dried paint or something, maybe three quarter dried paint, a little, little ticky, sticky. And you're typically your arrow shaft's going to be covered from broadhead to fletching, but you, you know, it doesn't mean it's going to be completely slathered and soaked in blood, but you'll typically have blood to fully assuming get a pass through, of course, you know, so those are some characteristics of uh, arterial blood or lung blood. And here's, here's an example. This is a deer that my son-in-law Joel shot this year. And depending on um, the device you're watching this on um, as to how bright this is, but you'll just have to trust me when, when I tell you that this blood was much brighter pink than the other two examples that we showed. But you see on the leaf here on the bottom, it's full of bubbles. Um, a lot of bubbles here. You know, this is the exit side right here. So you can see he did truly smoke that deer. Um, but it's a, it tends to be a brighter pink. It's thinner. And um, and, and there's lots of bubbles. Now, um, here's all three of them together. 
Um, you see the muscle blood there on the left. Like I said, no character, no character to it. Just kind of blood, nothing, almost as if you cut your finger and it just dripped there. Um, you know, just blood. Um, deliver blood here in the middle. Again, not the greatest picture, but you can see it's a little bit darker, a little bit thinner. This is the wound, a wound bed. Um, but but you can tell, and then obviously right far right is the uh, the arterial blood. And if you maximize your screen, you might be for whatever you're watching it on, you might be able to see it better. Um, but uh, you know, another, another indication that you might have uh, muscle or liver blood is that blood is is when it falls off the deer, it's going to be falling straight down within the width of the deer, it's not going to be projected out from the deer. There will be no arterial spray, as we call it, like you might have with arterial blood, uh, because it, there's nothing there. Uh, it's not in the pump station. There's nothing to make the blood go out um, to, to push it out. If the deer shakes or something, it could fling some blood, but it's generally just going to fall straight down. So that's just another indication that you might have uh, muscle blood or liver blood and kind of knowing the, the subtle differences between the two to help you de determine what you have because it can it, it can affect how you approach that track so so again just some pretty topical generalities about uh, the different types of uh, blood and their characteristics so so um you know, hopefully, hopefully that's helpful to you. So I told you I was going to talk about um, the difference between trackable blood and good blood, at least how I approach it, what, what it means to me. Trackable blood simply means that you can track the blood with your eye. It's there. You can see it. You can track it. Trackable blood doesn't necessarily mean good blood. And hunters, and I, I Lord knows I've been this hunter, just commonly, you know, good blood is just, is, typically lots of blood well i consider good blood blood that's going to render that deer dead so trackable blood although may be good blood in itself isn't good blood because you could have a lot of blood on a muscle hit deer particularly early on you got these mechanical two inch cut broadheads now that cut a giant hole and cause and can cause a lot of bleeding well you know, if you get that high shoulder, that high back whack, you know, you've hit the deer in a non-lethal space. So you don't have good blood. You just have blood. And maybe you have a lot of blood. That blood is not going to render that deer dead. So I don't consider it good blood. It's just trackable for a while um, until you get that three, 400, 200 yard mark. And the, um, and the, uh, clotting starts and, and you lose it but good blood like i said it's gonna it, it's blood that'll render that deer dead now can good blood be trackable blood a lot of time it can but not always so think about it the deer is standing positionally when you shot and the the hide and the body cavity are like this you shoot the deer punch a hole in it and then the deer takes off and then the natural alignment of that hide and body cavity is like this oops let me see you know it's like this now so the holes no longer match up and the blood can't get out your deer is bleeding like crazy on the inside but not a lot of blood is getting out but the blood that is getting out assuming that you you know you double lunged him you hit him in a pump station anything that is getting out is good blood because it's going to render that deer dead. You know, so you see the difference. There may not necessarily be a lot of blood, but it's good blood. And that kind of comes back to knowing the difference and, and just being able to identify some of the characteristics of the different types of blood we just talked about. You know, it, it will help you in determining when you should pursue that deer or when you should call a tracker device or whatever. So, um, what else were they going to say? Oh, liver blood. Liver blood can be good blood because it's going to render that deer dead in time. That's, that's the key word. Liver, liver blood is going to render your deer dead in time. But there may not be a lot of it, you know, and it could be hard to track. Liver blood, you know, it, it's not part of the, it's not inside the diaphragm or in the lung, so it's not being blown out. It's just falling straight down. 
very similar to how muscle blood's going to. That's why you got to know the difference between you know muscle blood and liver blood. And um, but a good blood, you know, but maybe maybe the hole got clogged up with some fat or some hair or something, and it just can't get out of the deer very well. It's still good blood because it's going to render the deer dead in time. So, so that's just the difference between trackable blood and good blood. Um, it's not, you know, never say never. And trackable blood, when I say that, don't misunderstand me. It doesn't mean you won't find your deer. It just depends on, on what type of blood it is. You know, um, it's got to be good blood to render your deer dead. So that's really about it. So he made you take from part one, you know, rule in one way, rule, rule, always be, you know, be honest with your tracker. Always. That's number one. You want us to be honest with you. So hunters, you know, we ask you to be honest with us. That is the quickest way to an efficient recovery or conclusion of a track, you know, um, you know, a successful track from a tracker's perspective. Some of the best tracks don't end with a deer on a tailgate, you know, you know, we look at it from from dog work, and are we able to miss the track? Were we were we able to provide a solid, reasonable explanation of what happened based on based on the track and all of the evidence? You know, so be honest with your um, track. That's that's number one. Rule number one: A never say never, never say always. Again, thank you, Brian, for that. Uh, I use it all the time. But uh, there are there are no absolutes. Um, so so those hunters truths that we grew up believing, you know, they're they're not absolutely the case. Um, dogs do not need blood to track. So take that away. So if you hit a deer and you lose blood, you know, don't not call because the dog needs blood no a dog doesn't need blood it goes back to all of those ingredients in the scent cocktail blood is one ingredient and it doesn't need everything in that cocktail to track so if blood's there great if blood's there you don't need us so the dog doesn't need blood to track so what does that mean do not pursue deer in the rain too soon oh we get that i just skipped ahead so we talked about something uh scenting conditions hot dry and windy are bad scenting conditions cool wet and calm are good scenting conditions Rain will not hurt the dog's ability to track. That's huge. Rain will not hurt the dog's ability to track to a point. Um, and, and that is, you know, you get a 24-hour downpour. I think my system just glitched out. But you get a 24-hour perennial downpour, and it can rinse that scent away. Um, otherwise, if it's just your standard fall drizzle that we're all accustomed to, that we get all the time in the fall, it's not hurting anything. It may wash away the visible sign. It may wash away that blood, but all it's doing is washing it into the ground. So the scent is still there. You can still, the dog can still smell it. Remember the dog sees with its nose. You and I see with our eyes. It drives us nuts when we can't see what the dog can and there's no blood. We want to see it, but I'm here to tell you, dogs don't need it. Dogs don't need blood. Rain will not impede the dog's ability to track to a point. Um, blood is a crimson dark. Blood will fool you. Don't take the bait. We will talk more about that um, in part two. So be sure you follow part two. But um, uh, the crimson since the doctors, it will seduce you into anything you do not take the bait. And uh, know the difference between a, a good blood and trackable blood. You know, remember, trackable blood just means it's blood you can see with your eyes. It could be good blood. Uh, but good blood is blood that's going to render that deer dead. Trackable blood isn't necessarily going to render that deer dead. It could. It might, depending on what it is. If it's a high shoulder, it's a non-lethal space. It's not going to render that deer dead as a result of that shot. Or, or at least in a sense that you're going to be be able to recover it. The recovery odds of a high shoulder, high back whack deer are probably in the single digits. And I've talked to some very experienced trackers. Um, one of my mentors recovered his very first back whack this year, and it was a nasty back whack. Um, another local tracker, shout out to my friend and, and uh, uh, Brent Ladd um, from Lads Deer Tracking. He, you know, he's only recovered one in, you know, the years that he's been doing it. So high shoulders are, 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 are not uh, real re recoverable. But, um, uh, uh, that's the takeaways, guys. 
Sorry, man, my system's glitching out again. I need a better uh, internet. I got internet service coming next week to upgrade. But uh, anyway, you know, part two, we're going to talk about the hunter's actions. You know, what the hunter should do before the season, what the hunter should do immediately upon the shot, and then the the minutes and hours following the shot. Um, and there's some good stuff there, too. It's going to be about the same length as this one. I don't know how we're into this one for, but... Um, uh, let me come over here, sorry guys. Let me let me minimize. Um, you know, so so that's a lot of fun. There'll, there'll be stuff on part two, and I'll I'll post the stream for that too. So uh, be watching for that. If you have any questions or comments, um, you want to correct something I said. If if you're a tracker and I've said something um, inaccurately, please comment. If um, if you have questions or, or feedback otherwise you can comment on this stream and, and uh, um you know you know i'll do my best to respond to it but uh again thanks a lot guys i i hope there's something here that you found useful um particularly uh, as a hunter please share this um share this broadcast you know uh, ho hopefully um you know i want to get it out there i kind of want to try to build um, build, um, you, you know, my YouTube channel and, and this channel, but so we'll do another segment. Uh, we'll do part two, like you know, hunters should know, um, next week. And, um, and then we'll, we'll start getting into much shorter, shorter, smaller segments about, um, well, cool things, um, specific topics. And I'll try to bring in other people to speak to those topics. So, uh, I tell you what, guys, thank, thanks for listening. And, and uh, if you're a, a podcast listener, uh, if you're a podcast listener, feel free to go to uh, Tales on Trails Deer Tracking on Facebook and YouTube, and you'll be able to see the presentation if you want to. Otherwise, um, you know, I'll continue to push the um, the audio piece of this uh, of, of this broadcast to. Um, uh, to wherever you find your your podcast so again guys thanks a lot i appreciate it um until next time man more of the good less of the bad talk to you soon.